Thank you very much, Alan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honour to be with you. Over the next 20 minutes or so, what I want to discuss is the future, not so much what the future holds, but how you might usefully think about the future. I then want to tell you a little bit about the research that my son and I undertook into the professions, and particularly the way that technology has impacted and is likely to change the way that all our professions work in the future. And I want, in conclusion, to offer some reflections on what this means for our jobs, for the future of our careers. So let me start with the future and a story about Black & Decker, one of the world's leading manufacturers of power tools. And apparently, Black & Decker, when they recruit new executives, they take them off on a course and they sit them down in a room, not nearly as large as this, I suspect, but put up a slide precisely like the slide before you. And they say to the new executives, this is what we sell, isn't it? And they all look rather disconcerted by this. They say, of course that's what we sell. We're Black & Decker. We're the world's leading manufacturers of power tools. The trainers, with some satisfaction, say, that's not really what we sell, because that's not really what our customers want. This is what our customers want. And it's your job as new executives to find ever more creative, imaginative, competitive ways of giving our customers what they want. And our view is there's a great lesson here for all professionals. Because when we think of the future, we tend to be of power drill mentality. We tend to think that tomorrow will be perhaps a cheaper, quicker, quieter version of what we have today. We tend to think that tomorrow will focus on the professions and the continuation of the professions, whereas we think less about the outcomes, what it is that actually our clients, our patients, our students require of us. And I want you to think over the next 20 minutes or so about this basic challenge. What's the hole in the wall in your discipline? And the book that we wrote looks like this. And the fundamental we, question we were asking was about the future and the impact of technology. And it transpires that there are two futures operating in parallel just now when it comes to technology. The first we say is reassuringly familiar. That's when technology, and by this I mean information technology, is used largely to streamline, to optimize, to sustain the current ways of working. So you might have an architect using computer-assisted design, a teacher using an online resource, or indeed a doctor seeing a patient across Skype. None of this fundamentally changes the nature of the professional work. It's technology that, if you will, turbocharges the traditional way. But in our research, we saw a second future, a more challenging future. And that's when the technology comes along, and there's no easy way of saying this, it's the technology that actually replaces our, own way, our old ways of working. Technology that takes on the tasks that we thought in the past could only be undertaken by human beings. And we refer to these technologies nowadays as disruptive technologies. Historically, people thought they didn't apply to white-collar workers, they didn't apply to the professionals. But as we looked across the professions, we found fundamentally that technology is changing and sometimes replacing our old ways of working. But it caused us to take a step back when we were thinking, is this a good thing? Is it desirable that technology should in some sense replace the traditional ways of working? We asked the more basic question, why do we have the professions? And we studied at length the history and the sociology of the professions. And we asked ourselves, what basic problems do the professions as a whole exist to solve? And it seems fairly clear, really, that human beings in our everyday life, we have limited understanding. And when we need help, specialist help, in areas that are important to our lives, we turn to professionals. This is the solution of the print-based industrial society. We have built up these bodies of experts who have practical expertise. That's the term we refer to knowledge, experience, know-how, often manual skills as well, the skills and expertise that we have that those we advise, those we guide, do not. And we have a grand bargain in place. It's a form of exclusivity. Professionals are alone in being licensed to undertake certain kinds of work. And to that extent, we can call them gatekeepers. So our way of distributing expertise and applying expertise in societies in the print-based world has been largely through human beings organized in professions. But we no longer live in a print-based industrial society. We live in a technology-based internet society. And in one way or another, generically speaking, I think it's fair to say our professions are creaking. Many of them, whether it be education, law, health, are unaffordable. Many of them are said by recipients of the service to be antiquated. Certainly for recipients, they're often opaque. They have no understanding of the underpinning knowledge. And in an important sense, our professions under form. By this I mean 
not so that people will operate at a low quality, but the very best expertise of the leading specialists is not widely available. Only a few benefit from this directly. So our question is, can we solve this basic problem differently? This problem of how we could maybe make this practical expertise more widely available and more easily accessible. Do we need the old gatekeepers? And to explore that question, we went to the leading edge, we went to the vanguard. We looked at the thought leaders, the market leaders, the disruptors across eight different professions. And we saw, and this was several years ago now when we did the original research, even then some fundamental change. In education, for instance, at Harvard, it's online courses. In one year, they had more applicants that actually had attended the entire physical, the, the university, the physical university in its entire existence in one year. In medicine, and this was early days, we were finding that the first port of call for so many people when they had a medical issue was at one website or another. And of course, we've moved on since then, and I'll discuss this. But we already saw at that stage 190 million unique visitors to WebMD in this country alone every month. Journalism was affected too. Associated Press used algorithms rather than human journalists to generate their earnings reports. In law, every year on eBay, there are many disputes amongst the traders. How many, you might wonder? And the answer to that is a remarkable 60 million. 60 million disputes every year on eBay, none of them resolved by lawyers and courts. They're all resolved by online dispute resolution. Moving on in tax, more than 50% in this country no longer use a tax advisor to submit their tax return. They use a system like TurboTax. Management consultants, too, are changing moving away from one-to-one -one consultative advisory service to some form of online package service. In audit two, a shift from the idea that an audit is a once-in-a-year examination of a sample of financial transactions to an ongoing examination of all the transactions of a business. Even architecture itself is changing. This is a Dutch firm who are actually designing and now printing buildings from 3D printers, three and a half meter blocks are generated and these constitute forms of prefabricated buildings. Perhaps our favorite was the clergy where we came across an app called Confession. This is um, an app that has tools that help you track your sin. It has options uh, that allow you to have a look at different forms of contrition. And this actually created so much controversy within the Catholic Church that in 2011, the Catholic Church in the shape of the Vatican got involved and approved this app, not as a substitute for confession, but in preparation for it. And that's very much the conception of the first future, that these technologies can be used to support the traditional way of working. But as we've looked across these professions, and we've looked at over 800 sources in eight different professions, the story is actually more radical. We live in a remarkable time, a time when we're seeing the emergence of artificial intelligence and various other techniques and technologies. And these are going to give rise to much of the work that we've traditionally done, as I said earlier, being replaced through technology. So let me dwell a little on technology, take you back to 96, when I made the claim in one of my books called The Future of Law. In retrospect, it was a fairly modest claim that the dominant way that lawyers and clients would come to communicate in the future would be by email. The Law Society of England and Wales, I kid you not, said I should not be allowed to speak in public and that I was bringing the legal profession into disrepute by making this suggestion. I say this today because your inclination when I mention a number of technologies in the minutes to come will be, well, that'll never apply to us or I can't see them gaining the sophistication that would be needed in our discipline. Nothing I say over the next 10 or 15 minutes will be more radical than email was for lawyers in 96. We all have different ways of explaining how technology is affecting our world. I do it under four headings, and I'd like to look at at least three of these. The exponential growth in the underpinning technologies. You may have heard of Moore's Law. Gordon Moore, a man who 52 years ago made what seemed an unexceptional claim. He suggested that every two years, the processing of power of computers would double. Now that doesn't seem that big a deal, and skeptics said it would only last a few years. But those of you who are close to your maths will you remember if you keep doubling any phenomenon, it gives rise to this explosive exponential growth in whatever we are considering. And what we're seeing is an exponential growth in processing power. And to get a feel for exponential growth, think of the fable of the princess and the tramp. The tramp saves the princess's life. 
The king says to the tramp, I'll give you anything in the kingdom by way of reward. The tramp responds, and it turns out it's a mathematically astute tramp. The tramp says, what I'd like is something quite simple, like a chessboard. And on the first square, I'd like you to put one grain of rice. On the second, double it to two. And the third, double it again to four. And the fourth, again to eight. And so on, round the 64 squares. And all I would ask your majesty by way of reward is that I have all the grains of rice that would accumulate after you place and double over 64 squares. The king thinks he's gotten away lightly and says, I grant you that wish, but it transpires. It's not his to grant, because that would require more grains of rice than there are on planet Earth. When you double any phenomenon, remarkable explosive growth occurs. And this is what's happening in processing power. We've had more than 32 doublings in processing power, which means by 2020, the average desktop machine will be able to process at the speed of 10 to the 16th or 10 to the 17th calculations per second. Now, you are wildly more qualified than I am to confirm that on one measure that's about the same processing power as the human brain. And there's been research that I've been exposed to on this, and we can discuss its accuracy. But if we stay with that model, the more important point is by 2050, on that model, if Moore's law continues, the average desktop machine will have more processing power than all of humanity put together. And this is not science fiction. This is the maths of this doubling we're seeing in processing power. And it's entirely remarkable. We're living, ladies and gentlemen, in a time of greater, more rapid technological progress than the world has ever witnessed. And to think it doesn't somehow apply to all of our professions, we feel is misguided. You may think I'm exaggerating. Turn to data, look what Google's chairman, Eric Schmidt, said every two days now. We create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003. By 2021, that'll be every hour, that quantity of information we'll be processing. A more prosaic example for the cynics amongst you. 2005, a good memory card for your camera would have been about 128 megabytes. Fast forward, not even 10 years, 128 gigabytes. That's more than a doubling uh, every year. So almost under any heading, whether it be bandwidth, random access memory, a hard disk capacity, processing power, and so forth, we're seeing this exponential explosive growth. And it is fueling what we call the increasing capability of our machines. And we, this is our key phrase. Our machines, ladies and gentlemen, are becoming increasingly capable. They're taking on tasks Almost every day we hear of a new app, a new development, a new breakthrough. And I look at this increasing capability under four headings. The growth of big data applications, systems that solve problems, the field of effective computing, and robotics. I'll say a little more about robotics today because I know how familiar so many of you are with robotics as it applies to surgery. But let me say something about big data, about the very large amounts of information that we create on a daily basis in images, in video, as users of technology. And the phenomenon we're now noting is that this data can yield insights, patterns, correlations, if analyzed with clever algorithms. Lex Machina, my favorite example in law, can predict the outcome of patent disputes more accurately than any human lawyer. It knows nothing about the law. It's done on a statistical basis. Who was the judge? Who was the lawyer? Subject matter of the claim? the size of the claim, the time of day, and so forth. We can make more accurate predictions on the basis of that raw data than lawyers using legal method. But we're seeing the same in medicine. The story this year that broke in relation to dermatology, as published in Nature, was about image processing and comparing the performance of the system against the dermatologist in identifying whether or not a lesion is a malignant melanoma. Again, really what it's doing, it knows nothing about histopathology, it knows nothing about dermatology. What it actually is doing is pixel processing. But actually, the analysis of these pixels, when using appropriate algorithms, can yield more accurate predictions, of, uh, more accurate diagnostics than the human experts. And we've seen just recently this story breaking, which is, again, using uh, images of the brain, uh, similar kind of analysis using machine learning techniques, discerning regularities and patterns and correlations that we wouldn't notice ourselves as human beings. It's pixel processing. Pixel processing, it turns out, ladies and gentlemen, can often outperform human beings. A second form of increasingly capable system is the question-answer system. Most of you have heard of Watson by IBM, the system that appeared in a TV quiz show called Jeopardy. And in 2011, on a live episode of that program, a computer system beat the two best ever Jeopardy champions. That's a system answering questions on almost anything under the sun more accurately and more rapidly. 
than the best human beings. On any view, some form of AI has arrived. And that similar kind of technology we're seeing is being used in, in oncology, for example, for the purposes of, of treatment planning. The third area is effective computing. That's machines can both detect and express human emotions. Many of you will rightly feel that vital and central to your daily task is your ability to sit down and empathize with and understand the emotional state of your patients. What's remarkable are the breakthroughs we're seeing in machines that can do similarly. Machines that can look at your face and tell if you're happy, surprised, angry, or disgusted. A system now more accurately than any human being can look at a human smile and tell whether or not that smile is fake or genuine. A system more accurately than any human being can now listen to two female voices and tell whether or not they belong to a mother and a daughter. By the early 20s, your jacket will give you a nice little hug when a friendly message comes through. We'll be interacting with little robots that will be chatting to us, conversing with us, and we'll treat them with the affection perhaps we have for a cuddly toy or maybe a pet or perhaps even an adult a friend that we don't particularly like that much. We will be interacting with our machines, with our robots, in a way that will surprise all of us. These machines, and it's disconcerting to hear this, will be better at us at detecting the emotions with those with whom we communicate. And we'll have, if you will, a massive database of mot juste, appropriate responses to the emotional state of their users. By t in, in the 2020s, your handheld machine will know what kind of mood you're in and will respond accordingly. And finally, we're becoming increasingly connected, ladies and gentlemen. Social networks for professions, 600,000 doctors already on CERMO. We find the same in education and architecture and law. And another form of social network, patients like me, 400,000 patients around the world, many of whom, and again, this is disconcerting and challenging, but report, particularly when suffering from chronic illnesses, they get certainly more comfort and often more practical guidance from fellow sufferers than they do from the medical profession. It's not just the medical profession. We're seeing it in religion, we're seeing it in architecture, we're seeing it in tax and law as well. So these are the changes we're seeing through technology, ladies and gentlemen. And the most remarkable phenomenon here is there's no finishing line. No one in Silicon Valley is dusting their hands off and saying, job done. In fact, and this is the most disconcerting of all, by 2025, the technologies that will probably have changed all of our lives they haven't yet been invented. It takes me to AI. The first wave of AI were systems that were programmed. We told them explicitly what we wanted them to do. I developed this system in the 80s. It was the world's first commercially available AI system in law. At the time, I want to assure you that that screen was cool. They were cool graphics, and now I accept it looks ludicrous. But essentially, we developed a huge decision tree of an expert's knowledge, two million paths through it. And we loaded it. This was in the days where floppy disks genuinely were floppy, five and a quarter inch floppy disks, a system that could reason better to a higher standard than the human being who designed it. And we did the same in medical, medical diagnostic system of a very early sort. These were rule-based systems where we programmed the knowledge into the system. Strange thing happened in 97. Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion, was beaten by a computer system called Deep Blue. But it was beaten in a different way. This is a system that could process 330 million moves in one second. We hadn't anticipated in the 80s the exponential growth in processing power that would allow these machines to outperform us. But note, ladies and gentlemen, this machine didn't outperform us because it had a model of how a human being thinks. It outperformed us using brute processing power, huge amounts of data, and clever algorithms. And that is what will replace most professional workers in the long run, brute processing power, huge amounts of data, and clever algorithms. Underpinning our confusion in all of this is what Daniel, my son, and I call the AI fallacy. We all assume, it's a mistaken assumption, that the only way we can develop systems that could perform the tasks, tasks at the level of experts or higher is somehow by copying human experts. That's the way we worked in the 80s. We programmed a model or a, a replication of the decision rules that people follow, or experts follow, into a system, made it available to others. But what we're now seeing is the emergence of systems that outperform us, not by copying us, but by using their distinctive characteristics. These are not machines that think, but they're increasingly capable, increasingly capable non-thinking machines. And they're, the second wave of AI are systems that aren't programmed, they learn. And a, a fine example of this is AlphaGo. Go is a board game, more permutations than there are atoms in the universe. About a year and a half ago, leading AI specialists said it'll be a decade before a computer system can play a good game of Go. Nine months ago, AlphaGo, a system developed by DeepMind, a company of Google, AlphaGo beat the world Go champion four games to one. 
Think of the second game in the 37th move. You can see it in YouTube. The machine moves the piece. The commentators think it's a mistake. A world go champer was later quoted as saying the move brought a tear to his eye and described it as beautiful. No human being had ever thought of that move before. In a human being, we would have called it creative. We would have called it imaginative. We might even have called it genius. And the remarkable thing is we can't ask the machine how it came to decide to move the piece in that way. How did it work? The machine originally was fed in a whole bundle of past games. Then, through a form of machine lear learning, it played itself a million times and self-improved and developed these algorithms, developed the software, not in the contemplation of the designers, but could itself then come up with moves that no human beings have ever thought of. And incidentally, that move is now a fairly central strategy to most leading players. This is the technology that's being used to analyze scans, eye scans in Moorfields Eye Hospital in England, DeepMind Sim technology. What does all this mean for jobs, ladies and gentlemen? One thing to think about for the 20s. In the 2020s, a very simple decision. Do we try to compete with these systems or do we build the systems? Is the role for professionals to build or compete? By compete, I mean this. You see, I hear everything Richard says, but I still think that almost all of what I do, no machine will ever be able to do in the 20s, and I'm going to compete with the machines in that way. To build the systems to say, I accept what he's saying, and it's our duty, it's our legacy, it's our responsibility as professionals to build the systems that replace our traditional ways of working. And that's what gets my vote. That's our responsibility in the 20s. And so it's not a decade of unemployment, it's a decade of redeployment. But strangely enough, the people who will be involved in developing these systems aren't people you would recognize as neurosurgeons or professionals at all. These are the people who will be designing, developing, implementing the systems that will be solving the problems that historically we thought only human professionals could sort out. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to that hole in the wall. What is it people are looking for? Is it the power drill of the surgeon or is it the outcome, the hole in the wall? What is that hole in the wall? If the hole in the wall is some kind of better health or relief from some kind of disorder, recovery, I want you to define it in your own terms. The question is, are surgeons, as con contemplated, the only way of delivering that outcome? What are our patients committed to? I believe they're committed to outcomes and it's our job in any profession continually to revise and challenge and upgrade the way in which we deliver these outcomes. This is maybe a naive thing to say, but I would imagine X years from now, people will look back and say, it's remarkable we ever used to cut human beings open. Uh, that will be a remarkable phenomenon. So it's not a question just of using better technology to continue being surgeons. But meanwhile, of course, there are a bundle of technologies. For training, you'll be using immersive, haptic, VR-based simulations. I think some of that's on display at this conference. For diagnosis, you'll be using neuroimaging and machine learning, much as we're seeing in the Eye Hospital in London. In treatment planning along Watson lines, we're using machine learning and personalized planning. And in surgery, robotic and stereotactic techniques. There's much that will go on before we cease, it seems to me, invasive surgery. But all the professions, in one way or another, are being challenged by this technology. I say again, our responsibility is not to compete. It seems to me it's to build these systems. Many of you will hope you can hold out to retirement before any of this engulfs you. I think others will see this as a window of opportunity. I say again, I think it's a privilege to be alive at this time of such rapid technological progress. The opportunity for us, for our generation, is to build these systems that will replace the old ways of working. I close the quotation by a man called Alan Kay, a Silicon Valley chap, who once said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I think that's great, because in the end, all I am in this is a commentator, a writer. I stand before, and I do so with considerable humility, a group of deeply expert professionals, absolutely the peak of the professional tree. And the question isn't to be asked of me, what does the future hold? I want to push the question back out to you. What future are you going to invent or create? Are you going to compete with these systems, or are you going to build the systems that substantially replace your traditional ways of working? Thank you very much.